when John the Baptist was out baptizing in the wilderness and he saw Jesus walk by, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. It was his testimony, it was his way of saying, this is the one. This is the Messiah that we've been waiting for for all of this time. It wasn't long after that that John the Baptist went to prison. He publicly criticized the king, and he was put in what was probably a dungeon under one of, of, of Herod's palaces. While he was in prison, he started to question. And at one point, he sent for two of his followers, and they came to him where he was in prison, and he gave him this instruction. He said, go and find Jesus and ask him this question. Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Even though he had given his strong testimony that Jesus was the one, now he's asking the question, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? So these two men went and found Jesus. And they found Jesus teaching uh, a crowd of people and healing people who were sick. And I picture this in my mind that maybe they stood on the edge of the crowd and watched for a while. Maybe it took them some time to build up their nerve to approach Jesus and ask him the question. But they did, and they went to Jesus and they said, John sent us to ask you... Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? And I think Jesus' answer is instructive to us because it's his description of his own ministry. And this is what Jesus said. He said, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus was meeting the needs of people. Physical needs and spiritual needs. And we see that throughout his ministry. The passage that our brother read just a few minutes ago from Matthew chapter 9 says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Once again, Jesus ministered to the whole person. He taught them the, the good news of the gospel message, but he ministered to their physical needs as well. In Luke chapter 9, when Jesus had recruited the 12, and he spent time with them, and he taught them, and he trained them, Luke tells us that when he sent them out for the very first time, that he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And we could go on and on looking at example after example in Jesus' ministry of where he emphasized these two priorities, preach the kingdom and heal the sick. And Jesus did those things together together. He did them repeatedly. He did them everywhere he went. The ministry of fame is based on that model from the ministry of Jesus. Of meeting the physical needs and the spiritual needs of people together. We call it medical evangelism. And it's simply this. It's meeting the physical needs or the health care needs of people so that we can have an opportunity to share the gospel. We believe that when people are hurting, when people are suffering, when people are sick and in pain, and you bring help, you bring relief for their hurt, that they will be open to listen to what you have to say at that moment, maybe more so than at any other time in their lives. And that's why medical evangelism works. Because we bring physical help, and it gives us an opportunity to share the gospel. Let me give you an example of what that looks like. If we could go to the next slide, this is Natalie. I met Natalie in a mission clinic in a Bangaroo Ivory Coast in West Africa. 
it was almost a year ago that I was there, and this clinic primarily treats AIDS patients. They have about 2,500 patients that come to the clinic every month. They have their blood drawn and tested, and they receive their medications to help control the symptoms of their disease. And those medications are effective. Even in West Africa, people live long and active lives in spite of the AIDS virus. But the problem, as you know, is that it spreads. There's no cure, and it's very contagious. So Natalie's part in this ministry is Natalie works with expectant moms. So when one of their AIDS patients learns that she's going to be a mother, then she works with Natalie. And Natalie helps the, the, the moms to reduce the risk of passing the AIDS virus to their baby. And there are things that they do. I'm not, you said Dr. Warren a few minutes ago. Thank you very much. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a, I'm not a medical person. But there are things that they do during the pregnancy. There are medications that they use. Uh, you know, in West Africa, most babies are born at home. These babies are born in the clinic. And there are protocols that they follow during the delivery. There are even things that they do after the babies are born to, to help the moms care for them uh, in a way to reduce the risk that they will get AIDS. And the good news is that they have a 95% success rate. A 95% success rate at preventing the spread of AIDS from the mothers to the babies. And that in itself is a great success. And we should celebrate that. But that's only part of the story. That's only the physical part. You see, Natalie is an evangelist. And Natalie holds Bible studies with these moms. She visits them in their homes and gets to know their families. And she prays for them and she prays with them. She brings them to church where they can hear the gospel. You see, that's medical evangelism. It's meeting a physical need. And that gives you an opportunity to address the spiritual need. That, and that's what Natalie does. That's a, that's a picture of of medical evangelism. At FAME, we support people all over the world who are doing medical evangelism, people like Natalie. And we do it in a number of different ways. The first one way is that we support what we call sustainable healthcare projects. The next slide is the picture of the, the very beginning stages of the construction of a brand new medical clinic in Cambodia. It's a very remote area. There are no other medical care available in this area. And part of the population of this area are people with leprosy. Not something we think about very often. You read about it in the Bible. But I don't know anybody. I've never known anybody that had leprosy. We don't have it in our country. But there are still places in the world where that's a problem. So our partners in Cambodia are building a clinic uh, to meet the needs of these people for the purpose of medical evangelism. The clinic will be built in two halves. One half will treat patients with leprosy. The other half will treat patients that don't have leprosy because they can't intermingle with each other because it's so contagious. If you go to the next slide, you can see that they have made a lot of progress. Uh, and this clinic will be, will be completed and, and open this year. FAME is providing the funds to build this building. But I want you to understand what I mean when I talk about a sustainable health care project. Once the building is built, our part is finished. It will be owned and operated and staffed by Cambodians. They will not be dependent on us uh, to operate the clinic on a day-to-day on -day basis. It, it will be theirs, and they will be the missionaries that are reaching out to the people in their own community. That's the goal. That's the way we want it to happen. It was 
was just uh, a few weeks ago, if we could go to the next slide, it was just a few weeks ago that I saw something on Facebook. You may not be able to read this, but, but there's a man named Simon in Myanmar, Southeast Asia. He's a Facebook friend of mine. He's one of our mission partners. And he posted this. And it says, thank you, fame, for your partnership to establish the Mulashidi Hospital 10 years ago. Now it is going well and self-sustaining without receiving foreign help. That's the goal. That's the goal. That's, that's what we call a sustainable healthcare project. Thank you. So we have a number of these kinds of projects uh, around the world. The next slide is a doctor in Kitwe, Zambia. When I first met Dr. Day, he was practicing in Casper, Wyoming. And since he moved his family to Kitwe, Zambia, and he's standing on a concrete slab that will someday be a clinic that will reach out using medical evangelism to the people in that community. Uh, the next slide is a picture of a, of a clinic construction in Perido, Haiti. And this is one of our longtime partners called Haitian Christian Outreach. And they already have a clinic. We helped them with phase one of their clinic a few years ago. And it's open and in business and all staffed by Haitians. Now they're building phase two that will include uh, two surgical suites. Up until now, in the whole southern part of Haiti, there was no place you could go if you needed to have surgery. You had to go to Port-au-Prince, to the capital city. It was difficult, it was expensive, and most people just couldn't. And so now there will be a place where people in the southern part of Haiti can go and have surgery. And while they, were th while they are there, they'll hear about Jesus. One of the interesting things about this project, you notice the red bricks. This mission imported into Haiti a machine that makes bricks out of dirt. And they're, they're stronger and more durable than concrete blocks. And the raw materials are free. And so they trained 20 men from the village of Perido to operate this equipment. And they'll save money on the cost of the clinic, but that's only the beginning. Once the clinic is finished, They'll continue to operate their brick-making business, and now you have 20 men with jobs that can support their families. And so it's, it's community development. It's, it's helping people to help themselves. And again, the idea of sustainability. Uh, the next slide just shows a list of, of many of the places around the world where we have these kinds of projects. They all have those similar characteristics of, of working towards sustainability, handing off the responsibility for the, for the medical outreach, the medical evangelism, to the nationals who live there uh, full time. And we're very excited about what's happening. The next slide shows a different kind of project. We have a scholarship program where we send young, bright young men and women to medical school, nursing school, uh, dental school. Uh, this is a picture of a dental student in Honduras. And she was recommended to us by one of our mission partners there. We provide a scholarship for her while she's in school to become a dentist. And when she graduates, she'll have a commitment to work with that mission partner doing medical evangelism for a certain period of time. We want to raise up a new generation of doctors and nurses and dentists and medical professionals in each of the countries where we work. So again, they can be the missionaries reaching out to their own people. They know the language, they know the culture, they don't have to travel anywhere, they're, they're already there. And so this is one of the ways that we do that. The next slide shows uh, just some, uh, a picture of where some of these students and some of these scholarship graduates are living and working. The next slide is a different kind of training. Uh, there's a program called Community Health Evangelism. And Community Health Evangelism is a volunteer-based grassroots effort in a community, and it has three goals. Community development, 
disease prevention and evangelism. The World Health Organization says that 75% of diseases in the developing world can be eliminated through education in the home. We have learned in our country how to prevent many of these diseases. And we want to share that knowledge with people in the developing countries rather than sending doctors to repeatedly treat the same diseases over and over and over. Let's teach them what we know about prevention. And so we train people with physical lessons and spiritual lessons. They implement those lessons in their home, and then they go to their neighbors. And they teach their neighbors those same lessons. And then they, in turn, teach their neighbors. And it spreads from home to home, from neighborhood to neighborhood, from village to village, and people learn how to live healthier lives. And along with that, we have an opportunity to share the gospel because the, every time the physical lesson is taught, there is a spiritual lesson taught as well. And as people show interest, they start Bible studies. As the Bible studies grow, they plant churches, and, and it spreads uh, very naturally throughout these communities. And we're very excited about the potential of this all around the world. So all of those, the, the, the clinics, the scholarships, the community training, all of those are projects that, that we use for the purpose of medical evangelism. But another thing that we do, if you go to the next slide, is uh, in, we have a warehouse in Indianapolis, Indiana. And we receive donations of medical supplies and equipment almost every single day. And they might be large donations, they might be small donations, but uh, people bring us stuff. And we have teams of volunteers that work with us to, to sort through everything and count and inspect and clean and package and, and get it ready to go. And then we ship those things all over the world to our partners who need them. Uh, the next slide shows an example of a donation that we received not long ago. Exam tables. A doctor's office called us and said, we're buying all new exam tables. Do you want our old ones? And we said, yes, absolutely. And uh, I think they didn't like the color anymore or something. There's nothing wrong with them. But, uh, but they wanted different colored exam tables. And so they gave us these. And when we send them to Haiti or when we send them to Africa or to India or someplace, nobody will care what color they are. And so, so we received these donations. And then we turn around and we ship them around the world. The next slide shows most of the things that we ship go on large uh, containers like this. And that's the most cost effective way uh, to ship. But sometimes we ship smaller quantities, even down to a single item. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, you'll see some pallets that we shipped when, when Ebola broke out in West Africa. Uh, there was there was such an urgent need that we were shipping immediately. Uh, these were some pallets that were going to clinics in West Africa that were treating Ebola patients. Uh, let me give you an example of how God provides. Um, Indiana University Medical Center called us. This is a couple years ago. They called us and they offered us 14 pallets. You see what a pallet looks like here. Uh, 14 pallets of exam gloves. And so, you know, we did the math, how many cases on a pallet, and how many boxes in a case, and how many gloves in a box. And it turned out that there was over a half a million gloves. We said, well, we don't know what we're going to do with a half a million gloves, but okay, so bring, bring it on, we'll, we'll take them. And so we took them, and then Ebola happened and many of those gloves went to West Africa because the healthcare workers were at risk when they were working with these patients. They needed gloves and gowns and masks and all of the protective equipment and so we shipped most of them to West Africa. So God provided for the need before we ever knew there was going to be a need. So if somebody calls tomorrow 
it says, we want to give you a million something, I'll be afraid to say no. Because God might be preparing us for what's next. And uh, he, he always provides. In the last year, if you go to the next slide, in the, last, in the last year we've made 142 shipments to 33 different countries. And the next slide shows um, a, a container that was going to Uganda, and we had a team of volunteers that helped load the container, and when everything was on board and they closed the doors, our team gathered around, put their hands on the container, and they prayed. And they prayed that it would get there safely, that it would arrive on time, that there'd be no problems with customs, and all of those things. But they prayed for medical evangelism. They prayed that the supplies on this container would bring opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus with people who had never heard it. That's the purpose, medical evangelism. One more thing, besides the projects, besides the shipping, we bring together teams of medical and non-medical people to go on short-term mission trips to work in medical evangelism. The next slide shows a boat. My wife, Kelly, led a FAME team last July, about a year ago now, to Brazil. And they spent about 10 days on this boat, traveling up and down the Amazon River, visiting villages in the rainforest that you can't get to by road, you can only get there from the water. So the boat on the first floor has two medical offices, a dental office, and a pharmacy. So they would pull into a village in the morning, and everybody in the village would come out, and they'd get in line, and they'd go through the clinic, and they'd get to see a doctor or a nurse. They might receive medicine that they, uh, that they needed. Um, when everybody had gone through, then later in the afternoon, everybody would leave the boat and they'd go into the village to the church. The same mission that operates the boat uh, has built churches along the river in these, in these villages. I think it's cool that the, that the churches are painted exactly the same color as the boat. So when people are getting receiving help from the people on the boat, they understand that it's connected to the church. So they would go to the church and they would have a worship service together. Uh, the, the, the team from the boat, and the people in the village would hold a worship service. When the service was over, the team would get back on the boat. They would travel overnight and get to the next village for the next day. Now, in addition to um, allowing people to see a doctor or a, or a nurse uh, and, and to receive help that day, the purpose of our short-term trip is to leave behind something that will have a lasting impact far beyond the duration of that trip. So let me give you a very simple example. If we go to the next slide, uh, the girl here sit, seated uh, on, in this slide, her name is Hanada, and she is Brazilian, and she served as an interpreter for Kelly. And they taught a health lesson everybody that came through. One of the things, not to be uh, indiscreet or anything, but one of the, the common issues in the rainforest is everyone has diarrhea. They drink the water right out of the river, and God only knows what's in that water, and so everyone has diarrhea. Well, um, it's not a cure, but the problem with chronic diarrhea is you get dehydrated, that can be fatal. So they taught a lesson on how to make ORS, Oral Rehydration Solution. It's sort of like homemade Gatorade. And so Kelly would teach the lesson. Hanada would translate it into Portuguese so that people could understand. Everybody would practice making a, a, a little batch that they could take with them. They would receive a, a recipe card in Portuguese that has the, the instructions on it that they can take with them, and then they would go on their way. Now, after a couple of days, Kelly said to Hanada, you know this lesson just as well as I do. They'd already taught it dozens of times. And so why don't you just teach it? And 
And so at that point, Kelly stopped teaching the lesson and had not taught the lesson. You see, our goal was to leave behind people that knew how to make ORS. But even better, we left behind somebody that knows how to teach how to make ORS. You see the difference? It's a, it's a critical difference because, you know what, people are going to get sick when we're not there. After we come home, the next week, somebody's going to be sick. And the week after that, somebody's going to be sick. And we never want the answer to be, well, when the Americans come back, they can help you. That's not the right answer. What we want the answer to be is, when the Americans were here, they taught us what to do, so now we can help you. And so that's why we, that's why we teach these lessons, is to leave behind something that has an impact far beyond the duration of the trip. The next slide shows one more example from a short-term trip. This is Burkina Faso, another little country in West Africa. And our partner there is an African church planter. And he contacted us and said, I planted one church and I have identified an area where I want to plant a second church. If you'll send a team, we can go out to that area We'll do medical outreach during the day. We'll hold evangelistic meetings at night. And we'll use all the context that we make to plant a new church. And so that's what we did. You see, it's medical evangelism because we were meeting physical needs for the purpose of gaining an opportunity to meet the spiritual need. And it was leaving behind something, a church, which will have an impact that goes far beyond the the. the week or two that our that our team was there. And that's the goal of our, our medical trips. There are a number of ways, if we go one more slide please, that there are a number of ways that I would invite you to be a part of the work of fame. The first is to pray for us. I can see that you are a praying church and, and we would appreciate your prayers on our behalf. Uh, number two, you could support FAME financially, and, and you do. And we are, as I said, we are, we are very grateful. The Cardboard Pharmacy is a program that we use to collect over-the-counter medicines that our teams carry with them when they go. And churches will, will do collection drives for vitamins or for pain relievers or things like that. And it, it saves us from having to go out and purchase them. And, and that is a big help. We use hundreds of volunteers in the Fame Warehouse. Now, I know that we're a long ways from here. <laughs> we're a long ways from here. But if you ever find yourself somewhere around Indianapolis, Indiana, I hope that you will stop by. We're also always looking for people who will go on uh, our short-term trips. You don't have to be a doctor. You don't have to be a nurse. You just have to be willing to serve. And uh, so if that's something that interests you, we would love to talk with you uh, after the service. You know, Jesus, throughout his ministry, met the physical and the spiritual needs of people. If we are his church, we have a responsibility to do what he did. So we need to do the same thing. And, and the principles that I'm talking about are not just true in Haiti. They're not just true in, uh, in, in, in India or in Africa. The principles that I'm talking about of meeting the needs of people for the purpose of the gospel are true in Indianapolis, Indiana, where I live, and they're true in Inglewood, California as well. And the people in my neighborhood and the people in your neighborhood have needs that can only be met through the gospel. And we're the church. We have to we have to meet those needs. Physical needs, the spiritual needs together. It's what Jesus did and it's what we must do. We pray with you. Father in heaven, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the brothers and sisters in Christ who are here in this place, who are light the dark, who are salt uh, to the world. And I just ask your blessing on them today. I pray that you will 
Uh, give them your strength and your power and the energy and initiative that, that is needed to reach out to people who are hurting, most of all, to people who need to know about you. I pray these things in Jesus' name.